Greetings everybody, my name is Paolo Ristauro and I'm doing this video as a part of the requirement for my class Biblical Hermeneutics. This is my first time to post in YouTube and uh, I'm, I will be summarizing the study that I have done for the past few weeks, a historical grammatical study of Isaiah 65:20 the passage that I have chosen. Now, in King James Version, it says, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner, being an hundred years old, shall be accursed. Now, in the, if you just read the, the passage, there seems to be no problem with this passage, but if you read the three verses prior to this one in verses 17 to 19 then you might have some questions in verse 17 it says for behold i create new heavens and new earth and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mine but be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which i create for behold i create jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy and I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, for the voice of crying, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more hence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be a curse. Now, it seems to indicate in this passage that in this is talking about the new heaven and the new earth and there is still death there in the new heaven and the new earth um, the problem of this passage is this phrase for the child shall die and hundred years old so uh, we are trying to uh, resolve this one I was trying to resolve it because in Isaiah 6, uh, 25 verses 8 and 9 it says, He will swallow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all of all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him, he will be glad, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Now, death is being swallowed up in here but in Isaiah 65 20 it says that the infant will die a hundred years old so the problem that which I was trying to uh, analyze is that is there still death in the new heaven and the new earth second what does Isaiah 65 20 mean about the statement for the child shall die a hundred years old is it literal or metaphorical or idiomatic? Third, does Isaiah 65:20 portray the environment of the new heaven and the new earth? Okay, so there are some views about this passage that I would just like to mention too. The first view suggested that the text in Isaiah 65:20 was deliberately altered. To make it contradict other biblical passages describing the environment in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, you know, reference was the Isaiah 25, 8 and 9, Revelation 11, 21, verse 4, etc. That the problem with the text lies with the Jews that desired to eradicate support for Jesus being the Christ from their sacred writings. So, they said it's deliberately altered. Second view is that is uh, suggested by many Protestants who believe that millennium, uh, 1,000 years in Revelation, referred uh, in Revelation uh, is not in heaven but is here on earth. Therefore, some scholars who had this doctrine believe that the setting of Isaiah 65:20 is during the millennial earth, that the life of the people are relatively long, yet death is still inevitable. 
So the method that I am gonna be, I was, uh, I, I used in this research as a historical grammatical method, historical grammatical approach of biblical interpretation, as I analyze the phrase for the child shall die 100 years old. Uh, contextual analysis, the background of the book. Now, before you can uh, do the conclusion, you need to analyze and. Uh, I spend a lot of time analyzing, especially on the authorship, um, on the authorship of the book of Isaiah and uh, on the date uh, written. Uh, I spend uh, much time because uh, it's my first time to know that, uh, to, to discover that some scholars, they said that uh, there is a first Isaiah, or you call it the proto Isaiah, the second Isaiah, or the Jutero Isaiah, and the third Isaiah, the Trito Isaiah. And I want to prove that Isaiah was uh, uh, the, the author. And so I have to look and see. See, the first verse of the first chapter of the book says, The vision of Isaiah, son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. However, as what I've said a while ago, that this has been challenged by some scholars that there are multiple uh, authors in the book of uh, uh, Isaiah because part of their argument is that how can Isaiah said you know in 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 the later part of the book in the later chapters of the book about the Babylonian exile it it, it happened 200 years after uh, the time of Isaiah so uh, Edward Andrews provided some suggestion that the primary cause behind questioning Isaiah's authorship is the same as all other prophetic books. It is their prophetic nature. It's a detailed history written in advance. They don't believe that, which is impossible for the biblical critic, you know, the one that's uh, used the historical critical uh, approach uh, to accept that Isaiah could predict 200 years prior of what will happen uh, in Judah. Now, Andrew's uh, father argues that the name of Jehovah, God, the Holy One of Israel, uh, is found. So this is his argument to prove that uh, there's only one author in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Twelve times in Isaiah chapters 1 to 39, and 13 times in Isaiah chapters 4 to 66. So uh, they credited only Isaiah uh, according to the critics, biblical critics, uh, uh, chapter 1 to 39 belongs to Isaiah, but chapters 40 to 55 uh, belongs to the second Isaiah, and then 56, chapter 56 to 66 belongs to the third Isaiah. But uh, this uh, Andrews, um, in his study, he proved that there is a continuity in the phrase that has been used uh, by the author from chapter 1 to 39, all the way to chapter 40 to uh, 66, about the, the phrase, the Holy One in Israel, 12 times. Uh, and then in the later part, 13 times. And you can only find that six times in the rest of the Old Testament Hebrew. So this interconnects the so-called two Isaiahs together as one. Now, this is another one. I would like to add this one. Flavius Josephus. The first century Jewish historian makes it quite clear that the prophecies pertaining to Isaiah belong to Isaiah the prophet. It is also Josephus' position that these very prophecies of Isaiah may have been what contributed to Cyrus releasing the Jews to return to their homeland. For Josephus writes that Cyrus was seized by a strong desire and ambition to do what had been written. Uh, uh, in this statement, uh, Josephus was suggesting that Cyrus have... Uh, read what has been prophesied by prophet Isaiah. So, if the writer of the they call the, the second Isaiah, the third Isaiah, uh, is not Isaiah, how can uh, Cyrus read the what, had, what is written in the passage and he says he wants to follow uh, what had been written. So, uh, that proves that Isaiah uh, is the only author, the sole author of the book. And also, I would like to uh, mentioned that I, the evidences for one authorship, uh, the use of name uh, as the historical grammatical approach, we know that uh, the Bible's interpret itself uh, it uh, referred to 
Uh, they're supporting with one another. So, there are 10 passages that I put here uh, uh, in Isaiah. Uh, the, the name of Isaiah in, in, in the New Testament, they name Isaiah, they, they, they uh, referred Isaiah as the author of the book of Isaiah. So, you can see there in the screen uh, some passage from Matthew, uh, John, uh, Acts, and Romans. And then, uh, cross-reference to that one is the, on the other side. Ten passages uh, that name Isaiah as the author of the former Isaiah or what we say the first Isaiah. Now, there are 11 passages also that the New Testament uh, writers mention that Isaiah is the author of the later portion. So, the Bible itself, even the, the New Testament writers uh, said that Isaiah is the author of of the book of Isaiah. Therefore, considering the portion of the evidence presented here, uh, there's more, but for the sake of time, we cannot uh, post here. Uh, we can draw a conclusion that one inspired writer who lived in an 8th century BC, whose father was Amos, penned, uh, penned the book of Isaiah. Now, what's the purpose of the writing of the book? The purpose of the book of Isaiah becomes so obvious when one steps back and examines its context. Uh, Saya is full of judgment of God, and uh, but also it slowly unfolds, you know, God's redeeming grace in the last portion. So there's the judgment for his backsliding people, but also God's mercy uh, in, in restoring. He wants to, his people to come back to him. And so the, the purpose of uh, is Isaiah's ministry focused on the spiritual and social aspect of the people. He emphasized the need for Judah as a nation to shun apostasy and idolatry and he wanted to save Judah from its moral, political, and social corruption. Now, the literary context, uh, the book of Isaiah contains prophetic messages that focus on the future of Judah. Uh, the prophecies are mostly in poetic form. And uh, the book of Isaiah belongs to a genre of a classical prophecy. Classical prophecy. Uh, while prophet Isaiah belongs to a, a classical prophet. Immediate context uh, of Isaiah 6, uh, 65 verse 20 belongs to the second part of the chapter. The chapter 65 is divided into two parts, uh, verses 1 to 16, and then the, the later part is verses 17 to 25. Verse 17 talks about the new heavens and the new earth that the Lord is about to create for His people in which the former things shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Then verses 18 and 19 talks about the Jerusalem that the Lord is going to create in which no more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. Then the passage in verse 20 elaborate further about the situation in that new Jerusalem wherein no more shall uh, there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who dies uh, not, who does not live out of a, a lifetime nor one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed uh, so that is the uh, immediate context of that uh, the larger context uh, of this passage belongs to the concluding part of the section 2 uh, in the life beyond exile of the structure of the book of Isaiah uh, the whole Isaiah this passage is significant because this is the Fulfillment of the promise of the Lord uh, on how things should be in the new creation that He is about to make. The passage covers the environment in Jerusalem restored after the Babylonian captivity and in the more distant future when heaven and earth made new. Uh, historical context, the book of Isaiah is centered in one of the most uh, troublesome and tragic period of the Jewish history. Lasor, Ubar, and Bush uh, thoroughly described the historical context in which Isaiah lived in, the, in their Old Testament survey. Uh, they said that uh, Tiglath Pileser came to rule uh, Assyria in 745 BC and conquered all the northern Syria by 740 BC. He subjugated the Ar Aramean city state of Hamath and Four smaller kingdoms, including Israel, to pay tribute. You can find the one in Second Kings, 
uh, in 734 BC, Tiglat Pileser established a base in Philistia at the river of Egypt, where some small states allied uh, to oppose him in a Syro Ephraimite war. Unlike Israel, King Ahaz of Judah refused. Ahaz turned to, As uh, to Assyria when the coalition of Syria and Ephraim decided to overthrow him. Tiglat Pileser invaded and overcame Gilead and Galilee and thereby took Israelites into Assyria. After Tiglat Pileser died in 727 BC, King Hosea of Israel refused to pay tribute to Assyria and he turned to Egypt for support. Eventually, Assyria took Israel's capital of Samaria in 721 BC. Then uh, Babylonians resettled the land uh, in 2 Kings 1724. With Assyria on the northern uh, boundary of Judah, Isaiah wrote his words contained the chapters uh, 7 14, including predictions of the Medes conquering Babylon. Ahaz died in 1715 BC and Hezekiah succeeded him. Sinakirib of Assyria conquered Sidon and forced Asdad, Ammon, Moab, and Edom to pay tribute. Sinakirib overcame the Judean city of Lachish and turned his focus to Jerusalem. After Isaiah's narrative of Sinakirib's failure to take Jerusalem in 701 BC, the book of Isaiah contains the prophecy of the Babylonian exile that will start in 607 BC and the Messianic hope. Critical scholarship dates these words to captivity and beyond, but traditional scholars see these words as predictive revelations from God. So, Messiah was able to predict what's going to happen because he was a, a true prophet of God. Uh, Isaiah, um, one of the tests of the prophet is uh, they can predict the future and it will happen. And so, Isaiah uh, passed the test of the prophet. Now, Formal and structural analysis uh, of this passage, the literal types. Uh, literary form, Isaiah is primarily written in elevated speech of poetic language. However, there are key passages written in prose. The remainder of the book is prophetic uh, poetry. Moreover, the literary form of chapter 65 of the book of Isaiah is poetry. Uh, literary genre. The general literary uh, genre of the book of Isaiah is classical prophecy. Furthermore, the specific genre of uh, Isaiah 65 is also uh, classical prophecy, literary structure. Now, it's interesting. I was trying to uh, research this one and I was trying to prove uh, you can argue. But uh, I see that there are three sections uh, structure. Uh, heaven, heaven, earth, heaven pattern in the book of Isaiah. There is a structural pattern uh, in chapters uh, of the book, particularly in Isaiah 60 verses 1 to 21, Isaiah 65, 17 to 25, when, uh, when it's, uh, in, uh, in which our passage can be found, Isaiah uh, 65, 20, and uh, Isaiah 66 verses 15 to 23. And so, uh, in, in these passages, uh, in these uh, verses, the author depicts a picture of the, the environment in the new heaven and the new earth, then followed by the environment, the sitting of the old earth, then concluded with the environment in the new heaven and the new earth. So this is the structure that I put there. Uh, if you can see, I hope you can see in the screen. Uh, so that is the structure. Uh, there is, seems to be uh, a continuity on how Isaiah um, speak about the heaven and then earth and then heaven okay and uh, now about, but our focus in Isaiah 65 verses 17 to 20 I, I am suggesting that 17 talks about the new heaven and the new earth while 18 to 24 talks about the Jerusalem the old earth after the captivity uh, a restored Jerusalem but still part of the old earth uh, and then verse 25 talks about again the environment in the new heaven and the new earth uh, this is the detailed analysis of the text. Uh, uh, there are key phrases in the immediate context of the passage that are important of this research to establish its meaning and fully understand the intention of the author. Uh, so uh, there are some key phrases that uh, I, uh, I have put here. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. This is in verse 17. 
the new heaven and the new earth is the expression the Bible employs four times. It's not only in Isaiah to describe the future of the redeemed. Four references you can find this phrase in Isaiah 65, 17 to uh, verse 17. This is uh, part of our study. But also you can find in uh, six, Isaiah 66, verse 22. And in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 13. And Revelation 21, verse 1. Uh, that the, the future home, uh, this is talking about the future home of the saints. Uh, in thus the consummative focus of the scripture. So uh, the new heavens and the new earth is the final destiny of uh, the people of God. And so this phrase is also important. Another phrase, uh, there shall be no more than an infant of days. Verse 20. Now, uh, Barnes, one of uh, the scholars, uh, commented on this text that the idea is that it's not that there should be no infant in those times, but that there will not be an infant who shall not fill up his days or who will be short-lived because of war, you know, uh, premature death. All shall live long and all shall be blessed with health and continual vigor and youth. And this is... Uh, I I I, uh, uh, I agree with that comment. Now, for the other phrase, uh, for the child shall die and hundred years old, verse twenty. Uh, considering the context of Isaiah sixty-five twenty, the phrase for the child shall die a hundred years old should not be taken literally, but locally. The prophecy being used here is more local in scope, meaning it is to be fulfilled among the nation of Israel. Thus, we should not try to universalize these uh, early prophecies and expect every detail to be fulfilled at some time in the future. Because if you look at it, uh, prior to this text is uh, talking about the Jerusalem that the Lord will create. So, the pattern that I, I talked a while ago, heaven, earth, heaven. So, the Lord, uh, uh, Isaiah talked about heaven when he says, when the Lord says, I will create the new heavens, new earth, but then in verse 18 to uh, 24 talks about the sitting of uh, Jerusalem in in Palestine in Judah at this time after Babylon in uh, captivity. Uh, another phrase that is important is the phrase that uh, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And so uh, this phrase reinforced the message of Isaiah to the backsliding people to come back to the Lord. This phrase gives the picture of what will happen. To those who continue to disobey God. In the wisdom of King Solomon, he also said, Though sinners do evil a hundred times and prolong their lives, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God, because they stand in fear before Him. But it will not be well with the wicked, neither will they prolong their days like a shadow, because they do not stand in fear before God. Ecclesiastes uh, uh, 8 verses 12 and 13. Uh, intertextuality. The King James Version. Now, I would admit that I like the New Revised Standard Version more. Uh, King James Version translated it, there shall, in chapter 65 verse 20, there shall be no more than an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. That is uh, closely uh, translated also in the New King James uh, Version. But the New Revised Standard Version rendered it this way. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out of a lifetime. Nor one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who fails short of a hundred will be considered a curse. This translation in the uh, New Revised Standard Version is closely uh, related also to the New International Version and the New American Standard Bible. The NRSV uh, contribute more light to the meaning of the passage, the New Revised Standard Version. We discover that verse 20 is talking about the environment of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity and is not talking about the environment of the new heaven and the new earth. 
Isaiah was emphasizing in the text the longevity and the serenity of the new era of Jerusalem after the exile. As long as the people remain obedient to God, remember this is a, a classical prophecy, this concept of longevity coincides with what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 4.40. Keep his statutes and his commandments, which I am commanding you to today for your own well-being and that of your descendants after you, so that you may long remain in the land that the Lord your God is giving you for all time. The concept of longevity as a reward to obedience is consistent in the Old and the New Testament. In Ephesians 6, 1-3, we are being reminded by Paul that children should obey their parents in the Lord, for it is right and it is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may be you may live long on earth. So, if you see that, uh, that is the uh, the... If you look at it, because it's a classical prophecy, Isaiah was uh, telling them that there will be a longevity, granting that they will follow the Lord. So it's a conditional prophecy. It's a classical. Now, continue another significance, uh, theological implication on this one. See, throughout the book of Isaiah, the prophet illustrated God's marvelous love for his people. The book shows how God longed for his backsliding people to return to him. If you look at Isaiah 65 verse 2, uh, this is the uh, immediate context, it pictured God spreading out his hands all the day unto a rebellious people. The prophet Isaiah unveils the sinfulness of the rebellious people of God and showing God's gracious provision of salvation. In the book, one can see God's unfathomable love for his people by giving them a chance to repent. Isaiah 6, uh, 55, 6 and 7 says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. In Isaiah 65 uh, verse 20, Prophet Isaiah described the environment, the sitting when Jerusalem will be restored wherein children and old persons will enjoy longevity and serenity. This testifies God's wonderful plan for His children. A restoration and salvation is one of the uh, purpose of the book also, talking about uh, God's restoration and salvation. Beginning at Genesis and all the way to Revelation, the scripture describes God's ultimate plan. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, But as it is written, what no eye hath seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God hath, has prepared for those who love Him. Uh, in our application, this passage in Isaiah 65, 20 gives Christians around the world the assurance that God can restore what has been damaged by sin. The passage talks about the restoration of Judah and Palestine after the Babylonian captivity. The passage shows that God is more concerned with restoration and redemption rather than destruction. This passage gives us encouragement uh, and to every believer also that even though we are suffering in this world due to our wrong choices, if we repent and go back to the Lord, He is able and mighty to save, to save us and restore us and bless us. The Hebrew word, by the way, of the name Isaiah means God saves. God has promised us in Jeremiah 29, 13, and 14, When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, there are some things that I would like to stress out. Number one, the key to understanding this passage is, as it is often the case, the context. The expression in Isaiah 65 are not really metaphorical, rather they are idiomatic. Uh, that is, they are idioms that are familiar and appropriate to the historical circumstances of Israel when this passage was, was written. Second, the sitting in Isaiah 65, 20 points to the condition in Jerusalem after the captivity. Though verses 17 and 25 talks about the environment in the new heaven and the new earth. Third, the passage was not deliberately altered, as some scholars view. It is all, also not ref, 
referring to the millennial earth. For the new is a very important concept in Isaiah. God announced to his people new things before they spring forth. In fact, he is already doing a new thing in Isaiah 43, 19. This new thing is his work of redeeming Israel, their deliverance from exile and the return to Jerusalem. The new is his work of salvation within the flow of history. Five, since the sitting in Isaiah 65, verse 20 is the restored Jerusalem in Palestine after the Babylonian captivity and not in the new heaven and the new earth, death is still inevitable in, in that city. Therefore, the passage does not contradict with the description of uh, Revelation and also in Isaiah 25 about the absence of death in the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, and six, the words die, child, and hundred years old should not confuse our thoughts. It pertains to the faithful Israelites who will enjoy longevity, longevity of life after long years of captivity. However, since the genre of the book of Isaiah is classical prophecy, meaning conditional, this means that the nation of Israel will be restored to its people if they will obey the will of the Lord and walk in His way. And lastly, uh, the text of Isaiah 65.20 is a foretaste of what will happen in the future where God will restore all things as stated in uh, in Isaiah and also in Revelation and in other passages in the Bible. I hope that uh, uh, this presentation is, is clear and uh, thank you and God bless.